David uh, Sloan Wilson, Professor of Biology and Anthropology at Binghamton University, named after me, of course. In New um, York, not England. <laughs> And is director of, how do you pronounce this, EVOS? EVOS, yes. EVOS, which is a unique campus-wide evolutionary studies program. Um, David has been championing the whole notion of multi-level selection for uh, some time now. And his most recent book is Evolution for Everyone, How Darwin's Theory Can Change the Way We Think About Our Lives. So, David Sloan Wilson. Thank you. I'm going to hold myself to 20 minutes. And what a wonderful introduction from Dan. Dan, it. Dan has heard me say before that science is a contact sport, so is philosophy. You try to throw each other to the mat, and afterwards you go outside for a beer. And so I'm going to try to do both of those things. I know I can do the latter. We'll see how successful I am throwing a big guy like Dan Dennett to the, uh, to the, uh, to the mat. Okay, well, uh, why is this not working? Oh, it's because there's another one. So we've heard some of this before, and these have been great talks. Um, uh, what was Enlightenment 1.0? The point, uh, two points I want to make very quickly here is that um, I'm not going to go 20 minutes unless I turn on my timer. Is that uh, originally uh, uh, reason and science was uh, was intended uh, was deism, not atheism, that we were going to use reason to discover about the Creator, um, and the secondly that this was suffused at least in the proponents of uh, of enlightenment with a profound sense of optimism that science and reason can improve the human condition. That's something that was true of the 19th century, uh, but not now. So what, uh, what happened? Uh, one thing is that deism morphed into atheism. So now deism, to the extent that it exists, only survives, as someone said earlier today, by encapsulating itself and protecting itself from any kind of empirical inquiry. So if you're going to use science and reason now, uh, then you're going to be an atheist, not a, uh, um, a deist. But the second thing, which hasn't really been emphasized yet, is that this, uh, we now have a profound sense of pessimism about our capacity to make the world a better place. And the best way to illustrate this, I think, is to simply say the word social engineering to almost anyone and see what kind of reaction you get. It will be a creepy reaction. And so the idea of handing over our children so that the scientists can keep teach them is something that is not going to be welcomed by many people, not just religious folks, because uh, uh, frankly, the concept of social engineering has earned itself a very bad name. So what went wrong, uh, I spent in preparation for coming here uh, hours, actually, reviewing the last year's meeting, uh, which I think can be uh, uh, summarized uh, pretty well here. It's not, it's not blame Canada, it's blame uh, blame religion here. And uh, so what I want to do in this very brief amount of time is to first of all try to establish that it is possible to recapture a sense of optimism about using science and reason to improve the human condition. Uh, but this, this requires a more perceptive analysis uh, than claiming that religion poisons everything to use uh, Christopher Hitchens' uh, uh, subtitle. So this you uh, already know is that uh, uh, before Darwin, theism was the best scientific theory in town. It wasn't until, as Darwin said, that we can reflect on these elaborately. This is his famous tangled bank passage at the end of the origin of species, uh, that we can reflect on all of these elaborately constructed forms have been produced by laws acting all around us. So we can really set the clock to 148 years ago before we could have a thoroughgoing atheism. And I think Dan would certainly agree. Uh, with that. Here's a point which no, is not made often enough, that for complex reasons, evolutionary theory was confined to the biological sciences and avoided for most human-related subjects for most of the 20th century, so that there's two walls of resistance. The one that we all love, and love to hate, that's religious creationism, which denies evolution altogether, and then there's the one that we don't talk about so much, secular creationism, uh, which accepts evolution for the rest of life but denies its relevance to human Affairs, And this is there's a lot of nodding heads out there. This is alive and well within academia, and it provides our first hint that we have to go beyond blame religion in order to effectively diagnose the problem. Here's a nice quote from Barbara Ehrenreich and Janet McIntosh about uh, social constructivists and postmodernists, the anti-scientific tradition in academia. I won't read it all, but basically, and like the religious fundamentalists, the new academic creationists defend their stance as if all human dignity and all hope for the future were at stake. But it gets worse. Here's a quote from 
political science scientist Ian Lustig at the University of Pennsylvania talking not about postmodernism, not about the people dressed in black, but the mainstream economist, political scientist, or sociologist. Of course, social scientists have no objection to applying evolutionary theory in the life sciences, biology, zoology, botany, etc. Nevertheless, the idea of applying evolutionary thinking to social science problems commonly evokes a strong negative reaction. In effect, social scientists treat the life sciences as enclosed within a kind of impermeable wall. Inside the wall, evolutionary thinking is deemed capable of producing powerful and astonishing truths. Outside the wall, in the realm of human behavior, so on and so forth. This was written in 2005. Now, all of this is changing, but only within the last 10 or 20 years. So, and the, some, many of people here in this audience are part of this movement so that they know about it. Evolutionary theories are spilling out of the biological sciences into all human-related areas, thanks in part to books like Darwin's Dangerous Idea, very influential in that movement, and something I'm very involved in in my campus-wide evolutionary um, studies program. So now being applied to all aspects of humanity, but so recently that even broad terms such as evolutionary psychology and evolutionary anthropology didn't even gain currency until the 1990s, and still have an air of scandal about them, not to speak of the humanities. There's people in this audience, uh, I was just talking with John Gottschall, uh, right here, co-editor of my book, uh, of our book, uh, The Literary Animal, about literature from an evolutionary perspective, narrative from an evolutionary perspective, and narrative and culture, of course, are joined at the, joined at the hip. And John told me this morning that when, when it comes time to applying for jobs in most humanities department, he would be regarded as a freak Freak was the word he used. And uh, Dan Smale, a uh, historian, trying to introduce uh, uh, evolutionary thinking into history. I don't know if he'd be regarded as a freak. He got into Harvard not on the basis of that idea, but on the basis of his very fine scholarship in medieval history. But this is the extent to which all of this is in the present and the future. Here's a, the field of economics as a case study. And I like what was said about it. Uh, economics in the previous, previous talk. So as we all know, it was dominated by rational choice theory, uh, which assumes that human behavior can be explained entirely in terms of individual utility maximization. Eventually, they decide, some people decided that this wasn't working. And guess what? They might have to do some experiments in order to find out about human preferences. And then was born the field of experimental economics. Well, any, theory, any, any uh, body of experiments needs a theoretical framework. So what's the uh, theoretical framework for experimental economics? Many will say it's cognitive psychology. But guess what? We need a theory to, decide, to, to find out where all that complex cognitive stuff comes from. And so now, and only now, are a handful of econo economists thinking about the evolution of human preferences. People like Ernst Fair, Sam Bowles, Herb Gentis, who are tearing up the journals. Their articles are appearing in Nature, and Science, and PNAS all the time. And in many ways, what this is, is rediscovering what the kinds of things that Adam Smith and other folks back then were talking about all that time ago. And so this is literally tomorrow's news. The reason I can only be here at this conference today is that I have to be at that conference tomorrow. It's a Liberty Fund conference. And if you know about Liberty Fund, they assign you readings like you were back in school. And so uh, we've been reading uh, The Theory of Moral Sentiments in this book here, a new book edited by Gintis Bowles, Rob Boyd, the great evolutionary anthropologist, and uh, Annan Frere, which is basically now and only now going beyond rational choice theory and trying to build a formal scientific framework for human preferences, basically. That's how new it is. And so I think that this has some sobering take-home messages. The kind of individualism that dominated economics for decades has been profoundly misleading, however scientific in appearance. And concepts such as the invisible hand, which assumes that somehow selfish agents miracul miraculously self-organize into adaptive societies, turns out to have as much basis in fact as the Garden of Eden. And so the scientific process can correct these errors and lead to a more accurate conception of human sociality. I am optimistic about the scientific process. It can take a long time and be opposed by strong ideological commitments, conscious and unconscious. And as for individualism in economics, so also for individualism in evolutionary theory, as we will see. So this is my opportunity to define 
the concept of a stealth religion, a belief system that departs from factual reality to motivate a given suite of behaviors without invoking supernatural agents. The absence of supernatural agents, a particular departure from factual reality, is just detail. And surely, when most people complain about religion, what they're really comparing about are departures from factual reality. That was suffused Dan's talk. And so if we're worried about that for religions, we really have to worry about it for stealth religions, because after all, they do a much better job of masquerading for factual reality than a real religion in which you could, they're so dopey to the non-believer that you immediately know that they're departures from factual reality. And so what does it mean to study human mentality, sociality, and culture from an evolutionary perspective? How can it provide a comprehensive theory of religion? And how can it help us improve the human condition, the Enlightenment project, and salvage the reputations of social engineering? A lot of it involves this concept here, of the concept of society as an organism. And there are some great scholars here. And so I don't have to tell them, or probably anyone here, that this idea is a long, long history, actually a century and millennium old tradition. So the metaphor of society as an organism existed before the science existed as a cultural um, institution. A, a turbulent history, not just in evolutionary theory, but also in the social uh, sciences. Among evolutionists, there's actually a, a widespread agreement that um, uh, societies can evolve to be like organisms in principle, but it requires something, and that something is selection at the society level. The, the mantra, the rule of thumb is adaptation at level X requires a process selection at the same level and tends to be undermined by selection operating at lower levels. In the 1960s, a consensus emerged that although the logic of this is correct, between group selection is so weak compared to within group selection that essentially group level adaptations don't exist, even though they're possible in principle. And 40 years later, we have a current assessment that group selection can be an important evolutionary force after all. Now, this is a long history, and it's recently summarized by a comprehensive article that's uh, just coming out in the December issue of Quarterly Review of Biology by Ed Wilson and myself titled Rethinking the Theoretical Foundation of Sociobiology. Uh, there's a condensed version that by chance was uh, just published in uh, New Scientist in their November 3 issue, which was just available online today. I checked my, uh, my uh, laptop, and it's actually now available online. And I would uh, uh, very much encourage you all to read uh, these articles to see what we regard to be the current uh, state of the art. And by far, I think, the most interesting development in evolutionary theory and very much part of this subject is this concept of major transitions of evolution. The idea that the balance between levels of selection is not static, but can itself evolve. And when between group selection sufficiently dominates within group selection, then the group becomes an organism in every sense of the word, a new superorganism. Now, this idea began with Lynn Margulis and her theory of the eukaryotic cell, the idea that nucleated cells are, did not evolve by small mutational steps from bacterial cells, but as symbiotic communities of bacteria. And then it was generalized in the 1990s by John Maynard Smith and Ursa Swathmarie, uh, among others, uh, to include other transitions, possibly even including the origin of life itself as cooperating groups of molecular uh, reactions. And major transitions have a number of hallmarks. First, they're rare events. It's not easy for between group selection to dominate within group selection. Second, major momentous consequences when it occurs because the new superorganisms now, these, these, these groups that are acting like real coherent teams, are so superior that they become ecologically dominant. Third, that the transition is never complete. Within group selection is only suppressed, never entirely eliminated. And as an aside, even in single organisms such as ourselves. So the paradig paradigmatic organism <laughs> is an organism. But it turns out that we're not as harmonious as we might like. And there's a really wonderful theory of cancer that's being developed as, the, as basically evolution taking place inside our bodies and so that we can really see this as an ecological and evolutionary process of mutation, competition, predation, that's the immune system, uh, all providing a comprehensive theory of cancer. It's very exciting. So let's pause to savor the irony. During the last four decades, it's been a heresy to think of social groups as like a single or organism. Now it turns out that the single organisms of today 
are literally the social groups of past ages. In other words, evolutionary theory, which at first in the 1960s seemed to provide a rock solid theoretical foundation for individualism, as the individual as a privileged level of the biological hierarchy, is now providing a very solid foundation for the concept of society as an organism. And the two um, um, groupings beyond individuals, use social insect colonies and human evolution, fall squarely within the paradigm of human major transition. So one reason why Ed Wilson became so interested in this and joined forces with me to write this article was that in preparation for writing his forthcoming book with Bert Holdobler, he decided that really the main principle for explaining the evolution of eusocial insect colonies was not kin selection, but between colony selection. All the hallmarks are there. Rare event, it seems all the social insects out there are derived from a, a very small number of origin, origination events, somewhere between 12 and 15. Momentous consequences. If you go out into the woods and fields, you'll find that over 50% of the biomass of all insects are these social insects, which are so competitive that they just basically, they displace solitary insects. Never complete, wonderful, wonderful stories about palace intrigue within social insect colonies. Okay, so there's lots of within colony selection, but they clearly result in the evolution of behaviors that we recognize as cheating, that disrupt colony function. And if you look at the traits that are actually responsible for colony function, those that do not evolve within colonies, those evolve by, by causing colonies to do better than other colonies. That's between, group, uh, between colony selection, and kin selection is not a denial of that fact. So now we get to human evolution and five more minutes to go. All the hallmarks, a rare event, we are the only ultrasocial primate species. Momentous consequences. Once we became a new superorganism, basically capable of a kind of a teamwork, which was not um, uh, present in our competitors, uh, we uh, became ecologically dominant, replacing all other hominids and many other species along the way. Never complete. Of course there is within group selfishness, but that does not deny the fact that many, many traits associated with our psychology, social behavior, and culture evolved, not by virtue of causing individuals to outcompete other individuals within their own group, but by causing whole groups to do better than other, uh, other groups. And these mechanisms go beyond, these are actually the four mechanisms mentioned by Richard Dawkins last year as the mechanisms for, that uh, can uh, evolve cooperative behavior, kin selection, reciprocity, reputation, and the handicap principle. The, event, the, the mechanisms that we're talking about go beyond this, and what they enable, um, what happens, what this enables is large groups of unrelated individuals to become potent units of selection. That selection can now take place not just at the individual level and at the level of small groups, such as uh, genetic relatives and immediate reciprocators, but it can now take place at the level of large cultural systems. This is something which has been worked out very nicely by people like Peter Richardson and, and Rob Boyd. And so, um, okay, so uh, I like to say that there's three C's of human uh, uh, special attributes, uh, cooperation, cognition, and culture. And um, people like Michael Tomasello originally sort of thought, first theory of mind comes in, first we explain our fancy cognition, and then this enables us to cooperate. But really, it makes much more sense to reverse it and say the first thing that happened was this major transition, which did not require exceptional cognitive ability. And only then did the other three C's, two C's uh, come about. So here's a plausible scenario due to Paul Bingham and also in a more general form by, uh, by um, uh, Chris Bohm. Uh, stone throwing evolved first. That was the first human adaptation. But as soon as we could throw stones at a distance, safely at a distance, uh, then we could do this. We could stone each other. Now we're talking about religion, aren't we? And so, and the idea here is that what you need to do, and that's what a major transition is all about, you have to suppress domination within groups. And then you get a kind of a guarded egalitarian, which is the basis for all forms of cooperation. And after all, symbolic thought and social transmission are, are fundamentally are communal activities that involve trusting your social partner. If you don't trust your social partner, there's no way that you're going to share information um, um, with them. Okay, now I have to make some tough decisions. Uh,
There's a distinction. Dan did my work for me here, but I want to make it clear if it wasn't already, and I think Dan did make it clear at the end of this talk, this is a descriptive distinction that I'm making, not a normative distinction. Just like Dan, I think my ideal belief system is good facts, we keep our good facts over here, and then we interpret them with a good value system over here. So we are both have that on the same page with that. But if you want to understand the nature of human mentality and the nature of, of cultural systems, in the past, present, and at least for the near future, you're going to have to make this distinction between practical and uh, factual uh, reality. And once you do this, this is something which has become very strongly uh, represented in this morning's talk. All of these different belief systems, cultural systems, some of them are transcendental, some of them are less so. All of them have this practical utility, what Durkheim called secular utility. Evidently, believing all this weird stuff does not actually cause you to become detached from reality in the factual sense, does not cause you to become detached from practical reality in the realistic sense. These beliefs, no matter how goofy, end up being very utilitarian. And so um, here's an artistic expression of that. I just love this stained glass window from St. John's University in, uh, in Minnesota, which combines the beehive motif with the inspirational quality of a stained glass window. Well, is this true of all aspects of religion? Jainism is a good example. How about this fellow? He sure looks like he's being wasted by a cultural disease. And so are there at least some important aspects of religion to be explained and so from the parasitic theory? And Sam Harris, last year, in his presentation, he actually talked about Jains. And he said, you know, when Muslims get crazier and crazier, they kill people. At least when Jains get crazier and crazier, all they do is do things like this. They become more pacifistic. And that got a good laugh. And so it just sure seems that, there's, that this might provide support from the, for the uh, cultural parasite hypothesis until you read the scholarly literature. And then you discover, as in this book, whose subtitle says it all, or the title says it all, Riches and Renunciation, is that the Jain, the Jain religion, of course the renunciates are a very tiny fraction of the religion whose lay members are among the most wealthiest and successful merchants in India. And here's a passage from the author of that. This directs our attention to the fact that yawning gaps between hope and reality are not necessarily dysfunctions of social organizations or deviations from religious system. This is just the point, is that when we look at something like religion, even though to our uh, humanist and enlightenment uh, sensibilities that might seem completely goofy, they are very attached to factual reality in a, um, in a practical sense. Now, what I'm going to skip over is some data. Too bad, because this is about to, supposed to be a science conference. But this is data which actually compares conservative and liberal Protestant denominations and show you how these religions, all within a single major religious tradition, utterly influence the perception of these. So basically what we're talking about here are cultural systems as like species in a multiple niche environment. Okay? That's the ecological and evolutionary paradigm is to be thinking of cultural systems not as viral like bits, but as systems that are like species and adapted to multiple niches in an economy. And I'm very sorry that I can't uh, talk about those. So, uh, so I will end with uh, uh, making a few points about atheism as a stealth religion. It's so easy to associate religion with blind faith and atheism with science and reason. And I beg to differ. And once we take the concept of stealth religion seriously, then we can entertain the prospect that there's belief systems which have nothing to do with God, not that particular departure from reality, but depart from reality in other ways. And before talking with the new, new atheism, I'll talk about the old new atheism, Ayn Rand, and Mark Shermer has uh, cottoned on to this example, they're the new atheist of her day. Uh, and yet, if you look at her, her, her creed of objectivism, you will find that it is like religious fundamentalism in every way. I have a chapter to this in my, in my book. But you know, you don't have to stare too long at a stealth religion to recognize its religious character. So this is on uh, the Ayn Rand website. Those who have read The Fountain Hen or Atlas Shrugged know that the sunlit universe Ayn Rand depicts in her novels is unlike the world that they see around them. How can one achieve the clarity of vision and joyous existence that her fictional heroes achieve? And Rand herself enjoyed talking about her own creed as a stylized 
universe, which very, very much departed from factual reality. You know, she died of cancer. She was shocked when she got cancer, even though she was a lifelong smoker, because how could Ayn Rand get cancer when she had no false premises? <laughs> and so, why do I call the new atheism a stealth religion? Because I think that it departs from factual reality to portray religion as bad, 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 in every respect. And John Hay, and I'm anxious to get done here so that he can have his chance on the stage, said something very nice in his uh, Edge piece. He said, it's like professional wrestling, great fun, but don't mistake it for a real contest. There is an emerging field of evolutionary religious studies. And my complaint about this movement, if we want to call it that, is not that it's offensive, not that it needs to be said, but it's just such bad science. And that this matters. And this, even in the space of Dan's talk, he made statements about religion, which I think are just flat out wrong. For example, that the reason that we have terrorism, and that Scott Atran might address this point, is because we stuff their heads with religion, and then that goes, sends them off to do goofy things. I believe that Scott Atran will beg to differ. And so if you don't, if you don't get the facts of religion right, then you're not going to come up with a good, a good uh, diagnosis. So either the new atheists have to actually put their money where their mouth is and be good scholars, about the subject that they're studying, or then they are, uh, well, that's exactly what they need to do. So here I am finishing. Questions to ask about religion. Is there any scientific evidence for the existence of supernatural agents? If not, how can we explain the phenomenon of religion in naturalistic terms? What are the impacts on religion, good or bad, human welfare? How can we understand, use our understanding of religion to ameliorate its negative effects and advance the goals of sect? These are questions we all want to know about religion. And my complaint about the new atheists is in the first place, for all of us, the answer to question one is a no-brainer. So we don't need to go on and on about it. And that they, they just get the answer wrong to the other three questions. I outline this in detail in a long review of Dan's book called A Scientific Exorcist Casts Out Demonic Memes. And a long article of, uh, of Dawkins' book, which is in Skeptic, will be in the next issue of Skeptic. And in his reply, what appeared in eSkeptic, Dawkins said, I only care about question one. I'm indifferent to the other three questions. Bottom, moreover, the other important aspects of my critique dealt in with other chapters of the God delusion are unaffected by religion's possible evolutionary advantages. I say to that hogwash, Hitchens did not title his book, God is not great. In fact, he doesn't even exist. He titled his book, God is not great, how religion poisons everything. And you, with Dawkins' book, you have to move past the title to the first sentence of the foreword. Imagine a world without religion. No 9-11, no this, no that. Religion just bad, bad, bad. So of course these people are passionate about the effects of religion in the real world. And it's disingenuous to, for them to, to uh, claim in the face of criticism that all they care about is the literal existence of God and nothing else. So to summarize, um, my main complaint about the new atheism is not that it's offensive or any of that. It's just bad science. So, the ideal enlightenment system. This is just summary stuff, so I'll stop here.